welcome to Research Land. Research Land is a project that uh, tries to make important uh, public intellectuals' work accessible to practitioners and general public. So we're so happy to meet you in our uh, series, Anti-Racist Education in Early Childhood Education. So we have a wonderful guest today, uh, Dr. Rihanna Thomas. She is an assistant professor of early childhood education in New Mexico State University. And Dr. Thomas's research interests are um, anti-racist and critical literacy education in early childhood uh, classrooms and contexts in communities. And also she is really interested in positive guidance in relation to the same topics. Uh, Rihanna, welcome to Research Land and we're so happy to have you here. Thank you, so happy to be here. I can share a little bit about myself before I talk about the research article today. I'm gonna to share my screen. So um, I am currently at New Mexico State University, an assistant professor of early childhood education. Um, my training was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and I lived in Kansas City for quite a long time. That's where this study took place. Um, in Kansas City, I was an early childhood classroom teacher. I taught first grade. I also taught toddlers for a time and three to five year olds before um, I went into teacher education. So. I um, am a true early childhood educator with that birth through element, uh, third grade span. But what I wanted to talk about today is my work as a critical race uh, in critical race parenting. So I am a mother of two children. Um, I am out white and my two children are also white. Um, and as I was learning about race and racism in education, I decided that um, my parenting needs to match my teaching. And I will share um, a story that really sparked um, my, my need to enact uh, anti-racist teaching at home. Um, and I often use poetry in my research. So I'm gonna read you this poem about what happened. When my son was transitioning from preschool in a white suburb to kindergarten, two doors down from our home, he said, will there be brown kids there? Yes, I said. He said, I don't want to go. I talked to his preschool teacher. She said, he's just nervous about going to a new school. Don't worry. Well, clearly I did worry. Um, I was very concerned that my five-year-old son was worried about kids who he called brown kids. And I thought it was very strange that his white preschool teacher was not worried. And so um, I decided um, at the same time I was pursuing my PhD and I decided I really need to learn more about what's happening here and what I can do about it. So the first thing that I think is really important to think about, and I spent a lot of time trying to understand is what is race? It's a word that uh, we use and maybe don't always think about what it means. And so for, for me, the way I understand race is that race was conceived to justify unequal distribution of resources, especially this brand of um, racism in the United States that um, it's used to justify one group of people benefiting from the labor uh, of other people. And race takes a, a group of people who are very different and pretends that they are the same. For, so in the United States, white people have a lot of uh, different ethnicity and ancestry, um, but they are treated the same um, and put in the same group so that that group can benefit from the labor of, of people who aren't understood to be white. And the thing about this in the United States that's 
really very beautiful is that despite the fact that race was something created to be very ugly and oppressive, um, people who have been raced and oppressed um, have worked in solidarity with each other against oppression to create racial identities that they can be proud of. Um, and so that that is is how I understand race and I try to help my children and the children I teach and the teachers I train to understand race. And then using, based on that understanding, um, understanding uh, an anti-racist curriculum. So here are some of the things that I think about when I'm designing and implementing an anti-racist curriculum. It's really important to define race and racism accurately, including examples of systemic racism. It's important to connect racial topics that come up to accurate history. It's also really important to frame people of color as agentive, you know, having, uh, you know, being resilient and resistant, and also for people. Um, understanding people of color as being diverse. You know, no one racial group is, is all the same. There's a lot of diversity within a racial group. And really important also to position children, even young children, as able to affect change. In my home, uh, the way that I enact anti-racist teaching and also the way that um, this is done in classrooms is to make space for talk about race, helping children feel comfortable that if race comes up, you won't hush them, you will talk with them about it. Also sharing materials that deal with race in an honest way. So reading materials, um, videos, movies, events, talking to children about race through these different materials. And it's best if those materials were created by uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And also attending community events. So I did this with my family. You can also do this with, your, with students in your class. And this is what I call an emergent curriculum. This isn't a boxed curriculum that I can um, just email to you and say, okay, here's how you do anti-racist teaching. Instead, uh, race is very contextualized. And so it needs to emerge from the experiences of the children that you work with. So like I said, race is, is very context specific. Um, even within the United States. So I wanted to tell you where this learning happened that I'm gonna talk about today. And that was in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri is a hyper-segregated city, meaning that um, racialized groups live in very different parts of town. Now, my family did live at the time of the study and for all my children's lives, kindergarten through fifth grade, um, well, birth through fifth grade, um, in a multiracial, multi-class neighborhood. This might sound like um, a, a special, happy place, but the fact is that the community was multiracial because it was experiencing white flight. And so you can see by the data on the chart that there was a lot of racial change between 2000 and 2017. A lot of white families moving out, African-American families moving in. Um, and in fact, my family, um, we got a lot of talk from our white friends about, well, when are you going to move? It doesn't seem like the schools are very good. Um, maybe you should move before your kids start kindergarten. Maybe you should definitely move before your kids start middle school. And they weren't saying um, because you live in a black community, but that was the undercurrent of, of why we should move. Um, however, we stayed in that community until I uh, moved, got my PhD and moved for a new position, um, a work position at New Mexico State University. Um, but a lot of the learning that happened in that community in Kansas City happened on the ball fields when my children were playing soccer and baseball. They happened in our church community and they happened at the local library. So that is the specific community that we lived in, but that community is located within the larger context of the United States. 
And the thing that is happening in the United States is that it's clearly a society that um, is founded on racism and continues to be a racist society. Um, but also it's a race evasive culture. So with the racism that's endemic in the society, there's this agreement that we don't talk about race. And this agreement between white folks not to talk about race in a real and deep meaningful way makes it really difficult to change systemic racism that happens in our community because we, we um, have this discourse of politeness and avoiding um, really dealing with race. But our words matter. And in the anti-racist curriculum, the words we use really matter. And that's what this article um, that I'll focus on today is really dealing with because we, all of us, and children especially, um, use language to think and to categorize. And because race is a social construction, something that people made up, um, we recreate ideas about race when we categorize and label and use language to talk about race. And every word that we use, and, and especially race words, have historical background, a social and a political meaning. Um, all in all, the words that we use to talk about race and label race and label people, those words are really important. And I, that really came out in this study that I did trying to understand the anti-racist curriculum in my own home. So I'm going to show you what I noticed. When I was looking at conversations I had with my children, and at the time I was recording for, for four years, I was recording conversations with my kids um, about race with their permission and with my, my husband's permission. Um, and what I noticed that is that the kids were using color words to talk about race and they were confounding this idea of skin color and the idea of race. They were treating race as if it was just color. And so, uh, for example, my daughter said, it doesn't matter if she is brown and you are white, I mean peach, you can still be friends. And so even though she was saying this kind of lovely sentiment of, about myself and a coworker who identifies as black, um, she wasn't really understanding race. She was just talking about color. Although she clearly noticed that it, something was special about seeing a black person and a white person uh, being friendly. So when we think about how children learn race, it's important to consider that children use the language that is available to them to make sense of the world. And so the language that was available to her because I wasn't talking to her about race, I wasn't talking to her about African-American and white folks. Um, the only words that she had were, were these color words. And kids use and learn color words in school, often in preschool, where we, in preschool, it's very normal for us to um, celebrate diversity, but a lot of times we're celebrating diversity without really talking about race. And that's part of that race evasive culture. So we'll talk about how wonderful it is that we all have different skin tones, um, but we don't talk about racial identities. And so along with talking about different skin tones, it's really important that we talk to children about their racial identity, ask families, how do you identify racially? And then use those words that, that children and families use to talk about racial identities of children. So later on, as my children got older and we got to really know folks in our community, we learned that some friends identify as black, some identify as African-American, um, some identify as Hispanic, some identify as Latinx. And then we can start using those labels and be more honest and real about racial identity and how race affects our lives. So going back before we got to that point, when my kids were saying things like brown um, to identify uh, race labels, I was using those same words that they were using. And I think I was really trying to protect their innocence. You know, my sweet five-year-old um, says brown, so I'm going to say brown. But what I was doing was erasing a conversation about racial identity. 
And race is so much more than color. I was really reducing it to just skin color. Um, it's so much more, it's uh, race is a historical and a political identification. Also, it can be problematic to say brown to mean black people that my, my kids were doing and that I copied because some people identify brown, as brown who aren't black. Um, a lot of South Asian, Latinx, biracial people identify as brown as their racial label. So it's really not okay for children and then parents or teachers to adopt color words um, to label other people. We really need to find out how people label themselves. Also, I found that when we were saying brown to mean black, um, my children thought that you had to have dark skin to identify as black. So one thing that we did was to read the book Shades of Black to help um, all of us in the family understand that being black is, is much more than just your skin tone. So this uh, book has photographs of children with lots of different skin tones and hair textures, and it repeats the phrase, I am black, I am unique. It also describes having uh, being American and having African heritage. And so this book helped us define what it means to be black. And I, I put here one of the quotes in red um, that from our conversation, this word black with a capital B, that doesn't really mean what color people are, right? Because they don't all have black skin. And so we talked about what black means. It's a racial identity, not the color of your skin. Another thing that came out besides confounding skin color with race is that we were really talking in my family, and this has been a really hard one to overcome, we were talking about race um, as a black and white binary. So my children would say things like, Fernando is kind of brown, or so that's why Jason looks blackish, and these aren't real names, I changed names of my children's friends. Um, but they were talking about people on a scale of black or white. And remember my child used um, brown to mean black. So kind of black or blackish rather than knowing um, any other race besides black or white. And this is really part of the bigger culture of the United States that is a lot in a lot of ways um, founded on an anti-Blackness um, way of thinking about race. And that also includes this Black-White binary where white is normal and good and Black is other and everything in between Black and every other race is between Black and white. And those races are often erased from the conversation about race. And that came out in the way my kids and I were talking about race. One way that we tried to fix this was um, reading the book Mixed Me about a child whose mother is black, uh, mother is white and father is black. And the child talks about race and how they are multiracial and not just one thing, not just black or white. And so this was another opportunity for my children and myself and my husband to talk about um, that race is more than color and that people can't be sorted into simple groups like black or white. Another really thing, important thing that came out when we were talking about, when I was looking at the race labels that my family used was that initially my daughter wanted to call herself Peach and um, me Peach. And I think this was based on the crayon and the color box that the children were using to color in pictures of themselves. That crayon was called Peach. Um, but over time, I realized how important it was that we understood our own racial identity to be white and what it means to be white. The quote here I have um, is from my daughter who was kind of understanding and getting used to calling herself white when she was talking about Hillary Clinton. This was when Hillary Clinton was running for president. Um, she said, Hillary is white, I'm white. And um, 
along with teaching our children that we are the race called white, um, it's also really important to teach them what that means to be white, even though that's really hard. Um, it's, it's not a good, easy racial identity. Um, we need to teach our children accurate definition of white, of what it means to be white. Um, and that's that category that's thought of as, as what's normal, but that's not right. We're not, there's no normal person. Um, it's just that white is kind of thought of as normal to make um, other races seem not normal. And it's also a position of privilege and that white folks uh, benefit from the oppression of black indigenous and people of color. And that even good white people, people we think of as good people are, and including ourselves, are often complicit with systems of racism and benefit from those systems. Now, understanding those definitions of what it means to be white and understanding that that's, that's me, that's my racial identity, um, it was really important for us as parents to pair those definite, that, that accurate def definition of what it means to be white with examples of white people working toward racial justice so that um, we as adults and the children could see themselves as people who can do something, who can make a difference. So I'm gonna show you some ways that we tried to teach that. Uh, we watched movies like Selma. And when we were watching those movies, we would have conversations like this quote here. Um, see why it's important for white people to help? The police wouldn't hurt the white people. It's important for us as white people to use the power we have to help. And so this was just an honest conversation reminding the children that white people have a privilege. Um, they're much less likely um, to encounter violence by the police and that um, we can use that privilege to support movements for racial justice. And along with plenty of those conversations um, that were aided by movies and books, we also, also participated in um, some marches and protests where the children got to experience um, standing up for racial justice. This photograph is not of my family, but it is a protest that was in Kansas City. Um, so this is a, a poem that I wrote about one of our experiences where um, the, the white minister of our church um, helped to organize a protest in collaboration with leadership from the Black Lives Matter movement in our city. And at that protest, we experienced um, the most privileged, that they asked the most privileged people to stand at the end of the line. And so, um, my family had to think about, you know, how are we privileged um, being um, cisgendered, being um, a, a mom and a dad, a family with a mom and a dad, being middle class, um, being white, and, and we just kept moving to the end of the line and thinking about the privilege that we have. And then also um, having an experience of not um, being the leaders in a, in a movement, um, being the people who listen and learn from leaders of, of color. Um, and also um, being in support of something um, that might make people think and make a difference and, and change our own thinking. It was important uh, for us, of course, to think about safety. Um, we talked with the leader of the Black Lives Matter movement who helped organize the protest. And she talked to us about safety issues with children. And, and we were very careful to protect the children in the, um, the acts that we participated in. I wanna share with you just some takeaways what I learned from enacting or trying to enact an anti-racist home curriculum. As you can see, I did not always um, enact that curriculum well, and sometimes I had to go back and reteach for myself and for my children. And the number one thing is that parents and teachers who are trying to enact an anti-racist curriculum, especially white folks, 
um, really need to spend a lot of time improving our own critical racial literacy. So this is ongoing work. I still am reading and learning and, and racism changes and we, it's ongoing work. You always have to be learning in order to enact this curriculum well. Also, um, very important to provide accurate and, and historically grounded definitions when we're talking about race. Seeking out books, movies, and community events that are led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And when topics emerge around race, it's really important for us to lean into those topics rather than ignoring them. If you don't have the answer right away, let the kids know, I don't know, but I'm gonna get back to you on that. And maybe your answer is, is from something written or produced by a black indigenous or person of color. I've done that a lot of times. And also really important was for us to spend time in multiracial spaces where we were welcome in our neighborhood, in our school community, in community events, at the library. Um, I know that not everyone has the opportunity um, to live in a multiracial neighborhood, but you can seek out those spaces. Um, maybe the public library in a multiracial neighborhood or a park in that neighborhood. Um, just make sure that you are entering spaces where you are welcome. And I'll just conclude this presentation with an idea that I found really important. Um, the anti-racist home curriculum is cumulative, it's ongoing and it's lifelong. Um, you will make mistakes. I have made so many mistakes, um, but that's not the end of the story. If you make a mistake, keep going. There's more teaching to do. Um, and those mistakes can help us improve the curriculum as we go. And I do have just a few um, resources that I know Zeynep will share um, in the links and things. So um, yeah, I'm, I will stop my share and we can have some discussion. This was awesome. Such a treat, Rihanna. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful resources too. All of these books, like even if um, hopefully we can list them all in the information section, but even if we cannot all do all, people will be able to see those pictures and hopefully engage in with those books. As a reminder to our viewers, we are with Dr. Rihanna Thomas, um, Assistant Professor of Early Childhood Education in New Mexico State University. She is specifically talking about her 2019 article, developing a vocabulary to talk about race in the white home, one family's experience. And I, as, as you might have noticed in Rihanna's presentation, uh, one part that is so unique, and that's why our team really loved this piece, is that she actually did an autoethnography, meaning that exploring your own experiences um, on a topic that is um, that is sort of like the core of your research project. So I congratulate you for doing this work, Rihanna. A lot of us as early childhood educators and teacher educators really try to stress the importance of it, but not everyone can go and actually implement a home curriculum, which you, which you stressed a couple of times that this is an endeavor. Uh, it just means being so intentional, so thoughtful in all of your interactions with your children. I, I commend you that it, that was so, uh, that was a tough job and, and you, mm -hmm. you really uh, took it to heart. I really, really appreciate you for doing this because it's such a good example for all of us, right? Um, so I guess my first question is relevant to um, how, how you can talk about now this with authority uh, as someone who did the work, right? Like, so I guess mm -hmm. one of the pieces where uh, sometimes people of color uh, get really frustrated is that there, there's always so much didactic messages going around telling them how to do how to do this work or how to do cultural diversity how to be culturally responsive i always try to emphasize with white folks that 
it is the same, like if you think about it bi-directionally, it's the same. We always have so much a focus of uh, white folks recognizing their identities, but I feel like you, uh, you doing this, you know, um, will be, I guess, a friendly um, and inviting message to others. Do you want to? Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Um, the important role of, you know, uh, white parents, white families in engaging in this work. Um, because yours is such a great example, but unfortunately, those examples are not extremely common, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the autoethnographic aspect of the work, I, I've always um, been really passionate about um, education's role in dismantling racism, um, even before I really knew how that might happen. Um, so when I started my dissertation work, this was the only thing that felt okay. Um, the first thing that any person, but especially white people need to do before enacting um, anti-racist curriculum is understand their own role. And so that was really what this work was about to understand how am I part of the system that perpetuates racism. Um, and I'm continue, continuing to try to understand that work. Um, and I, before you do that, you're really not quite ready um, to teach. Um, so I, I think that's why I approach the work that way. Um, one exciting thing that I have seen happen since um, the Black Lives Matter uprising and um, the uprising after the murder of George Floyd is so many more um, white moms who I know are, are reading and trying to understand and they're doing that identity work and they're starting to have more conversations with their own children and with and um, I've seen some, some really surprising um, conversations of, of, of white moms calling out other white moms and, and, and it's I, I don't want to um, promote a call out culture where, you know, I'm more woke than you are. That's not what this is about. Um, but just kind of challenging each other to say, well, maybe you should think about that from another perspective, or have you read this? Um, and so I think it's happening more and more and, and um, that's exciting. And, but I think it just needs to be really careful work in that, um, no one knows all of the answers um, and that it's it's this ongoing process and no one, not even myself, I need to feel like we arrived. Like I, I don't 100% know how to do this, but it's always kind of working toward um, better, better parenting, better teaching. Absolutely, thank you so much. That was a great insight and truly inspiring. I guess my second question is about um, one sentence that you put in the article, which I think is really, really important. You said in the article, due to a white supremacy endemic in our society, if we do not teach and define accurate racial labels directly, our, our children will learn white supremacy indirectly. So that's mm -hmm. kind of like this whole elephant in the room metaphor. So can you tell us a little bit more about it, how it grows in, in specifically in white households, but also right, white majority classrooms, definitely, um, or even in other early childhood classrooms where uh, we kind of do not mention that because it's a hard topic. Mm. I'm thinking about um, two people whose work has really helped me understand this. Um, Aaron Miller did a, a really, thoughtful parent-child ethnography, um, trying to understand how her white children were learning race and racism. And so she was cataloging um, and she lived in South Carolina, I believe. Um, and so she was cataloging the mail that came into their homes, the, the products they were buying at the grocery store, the school curriculum um, and they were not learning accurate history about reconstruction and, and um, civil rights movements. And 
if she wasn't carefully looking at those things, she wouldn't be ready to have those conversations with the kids about accurate history um, and, and what it, and accurate definitions of race. Um, and then I also think about um, Vivian Gusson Paley, who we all um, know and love. And um, I read her book so long ago, A White Teacher. And she said, um, she wrote in that book, what we care about, we talk about. And if we continue to push aside um, top, talking about race or thinking of each other as people who have a racial identity, then, then we don't, then we erase that part of children's lives. We act as though race doesn't matter. Um, and, and while we might wish that race doesn't matter, it, it does. And so if we treat it as if it doesn't, then we're just perpetuating um, this racist culture. So very important, very interesting. Um, I guess my other question is related to have you found children's, like your children's responses back to you? Because we all know that you know, developmentally, it's truly hard work. It's not high school students that you can truly have a sort of like a very intense, deep level logical conversation, but we have to recognize, and I think you're the perfect person to do it because you're an early childhood expert. So you completely understand where they come from and why they say certain things. I guess um, my question is about the challenges on the road. Like as people are trying to do that, one particular challenge that I could think of throughout the article was that the social cognition piece, meaning social cognition means for our viewers, um, understanding how other people's labels or perspectives might be different or definitions might be different than yours. And what happens to uh, you if they look at you differently? So how do, how do other people's uh, perception about you actually impact you? So I think that's a critical piece to understand why racism is so harmful, but at the same time for children to understand like why somebody, why things somebody sees is so critical um, must be hard. So do you mm -hmm. wanna speak more to that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I will try. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I, maybe I'll start with some examples of of what my children ended up doing with this thinking about, about race. Um, I'm, I'm working on um, getting this work out in publication and I've presented on it some, but um, when my son was in, I think it was third and fourth grade, I learned that he had been kneeling for the pledge. And so we're getting toward the end of, of early childhood. He's getting a little bit older. Um, and so um, this was something that he did as a white student in a classroom that was 50% um, African-American. And he decided after reading, I think a, a story in Scholastic News about Colin Kaepernick and his decision to kneel, um, to show, uh, to, to make the point that things are not fair and that, um, that changes need to be made in the United States for racial justice, my son decided, you know, I think I wanna make that point too. And he decided to do that in his classroom. And my daughter, when she was um, younger, um, I think it was second or third grade, she created a zine about police brutality. Um, and, and in that little zine that she created at a zine con, so another one of those community events that we went to that gave them opportunities to think about, um, you know, to interact with people and to, to see how different uh, racialized current events affected different people and, and then make something. So she, um, she created a zine about police brutality and um, drew pictures of, um, white officer uh, shooting a black person. And so we live in a time, and maybe there's always, maybe it's always this time in the United States, but, but now we live in a time where children are seeing the physical effects of racism. And so they can see, oh, black people are incurring more violence than, than white people. Um, and so I think, 
I think it, it's much more clear to them than maybe we realize. Um, and so th they demonstrated that understanding through some uh, political acts of their own. Um, and may maybe I'll leave it there unless you have a follow-up question. I don't think I answered everything, but. No, no, that's great. I think you're, you're pos posing like an opportunity for us here and maybe showing us, you know, different sides of it. Maybe they're more aware, right? Like, so maybe, maybe we should not confine ourselves with that. Okay, is that going to be a challenge thinking? Maybe they already see it, like you say. I think you make a great point. Um, I guess before we conclude today, I just had a um, general question about like your perspective. I think you mentioned in the article too that your work is leaning towards something beyond anti-bias teaching um, mm -hmm. and maybe anti-racist teaching is taking it a little bit further. Uh, would you say some things that, is, that, that could be encouraging for people to explore uh, that beyond and about perspective a little bit? Although we value both and, and all of other perspectives, they're all uh, essentially so, so uh, important, but um, what, is, what is something that could be um, you know, beneficial or different or unique about this new perspective? I, I re wanna repeat the words that you use or the concepts you use. You talked about critical race parenting, you talked about anti-racist um, approaches and we can, I guess, call it anti-racist parenting as well. Mm. Um, so that, thinking is very much inspired by Dr. Carrie Ann Eskeg. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, and she has written um, in collaboration with other folks, uh, three articles that have been very influential to me um, about uh, comparing anti-bias uh, approaches um, and anti-racist approaches. And she really um, writes about if that anti-bias and can sometimes give us an excuse to be race evasive. So if we're saying things like everyone's equal, all skin colors are beautiful, um, then we're still leaving out what's happening in our society. We're still leaving out that, um, that, that may be true, that all colors are beautiful and all skin tones are wonderful, but we're leaving out this historic oppression and, and everyday oppression. And we're leaving out a big piece of, of racial identity and the oppression that children and families experience every day. And if we don't teach children that, then we are just perpetuating that system uh, of racism. Awesome. Thank you so much. I guess in conclusion, I wanted to ask one more tiny question. I'm always interested in your personal background as well. What made you aware or passionate about inequalities in society, particularly like as a child or a young person, if you can speak to that a little bit, what started that um, perspective in your mind? You know, I, I wonder that of because it's something that I have always cared um, a lot about. And I don't know that I can pinpoint it. I think learning about the civil rights movement as a child, um, I went to um, what we thought of as the poor kids elementary school in my town uh, in the mid, mid Missouri. And um, that means that there, there, was one kid, there was one school that was worse um, off than ours. And that was the black kids elementary school. And we all just kind of knew that. Um, but my, my school kind of being on uh, the low income side of town did have some African American students and teachers. And, um, I remember my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Madden was a, a black man. And, um, you know how sometimes you have a teacher who just kind of sees you. He, um, I think saw me as a, a student who had potential and, and, and liked to think and um, was always very kind to me. Um, and I remember um, that year that another student who I thought would be in my fifth grade class opted out. Um, her parents had asked that she not be in his class because he was black. Um, and, you know, this was the 80s. Um, we were supposed to be 
past all of you know the the discourse in the country was that we were past all of all of that we had been through the civil rights movement um but i, I remember that making a big impression on me um that experience it must be very impactful oh. well thank you so much rihanna this was such a treat for us to learn more from you and uh the ability to share your article is really exciting it's an open access article so we're gonna link that along with any other information you would like to share with us so dr thomas's um hopefully social media accounts and um, her contact information will be there. So please reach out to her to utilize her expertise. Um, if you are an organization doing this anti-racist uh, work, starting to get into it, please find her and utilize her expertise. For our viewers, please subscribe and get notified if we have this uh, new videos within that series and other important work by ResearchLand. So uh, we truly thank you so much for coming and uh, being a guest in our program, Rihanna. We oh, appreciate thank you, you so much for having me. I had a wonderful time. Great. Have a great day. Bye.